So welcome to the Virtual Venture Cafe, everyone. It is our Defense Innovation Conference. Uh, I would like to extend a very special welcome to our first time community members. So it's 4.31 Eastern time and Megan, I am handing this session over to you. Excellent. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi again. Uh, thank you all to our next presenters who will be joining us. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, stay on schedule. So our first presenter is Dr. Robert Bach from Ardex Systems. And Dr. Robert Bach is the founder and CEO. He has developed advanced solutions for a broad range of military and civilian applications. His expertise is in machine learning and artificial intelligence, EOIR sensors, radar, wireless communications, sensor fusion, autonomous systems, atmospheric effects modeling, and multispectral electromagnetic propagation modeling. Robert received a BS from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an MS from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a PhD from the University of Texas, all in physics. Robert, we're really excited to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. I will turn it over to you, and if you would like to uh, share your slides whenever you are ready. Yeah, I apologize. Let me get that going here. <laughs> okay, is that is that working? That's great. Okay, so... I don't think it's in presentation mode just yet. Oh, there he goes. Perfect. Awesome. So, can everyone see my slides? Yes, you are good. Yeah. Let me just start. Okay, so we're, thank you for the introduction and thank you for including us today. We're really excited to be part of this. Uh, we are Ardex Systems and uh, as you see from the tagline, empowering the world's decision makers with artificial intelligence. Uh, today I'll be focusing on, on our defense division. Uh, we do have another division that uh, is engaged in robotics, but today I'll be focused on all of our artificial intelligence work in the defense division. Uh, so the problem that we're addressing today is sensor data overload. And when I talk about a sensor, I'm talking about, um, you know, any type of data, whether it's imagery or signal data, uh, when a signal data includes communication, radar data, um, weapons data, and, and uh, even, even acoustic data. So we're, we're, we're really sensor and data agnostic here. Uh, we have certainly focused in, on certain types of data sets, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But you know, any, any data from any platform is, uh, is of interest to us, and we want to address that problem. Now, the result of, of this problem, of course, is human analysts are overwhelmed. Um, and as you see from the imagery I have here, I am, we are focused on military applications. But um, you know, we'll talk, touch on this later, that in addition to the military applications, there's quite a few commercial and non-military applications to what we're doing here at Ardex Systems. And I do believe, according to, you know, per some of the uh, presentations we heard earlier, that are uh, very applicable to uh, some of the business segments there at BAE. Uh, next, uh, next slide here. Um, so how do, we, how do we solve it? Well, we didn't come up with it. You know, there's AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning is, is being used to reduce the cognitive load on human analysts. So you have a ton of sensor data come in, you have this magical AI system, this processor, and it has typically can serve two functions. One, it either assists the human analyst to reduce the cognitive load, or, or either it could replace the analyst, make the decision, and, uh, and go to a control and be a fully autonomous system. Um, for the most part, you know, for these mission critical type of decisions, um, very important decisions, you are gonna have a human analyst in the loop. And quite a bit of our work here is focused on that, really assisting the analysts Again, reducing that cognitive load. Um, and that's, that's been uh, most of our focus here, but it, it, it doesn't preclude that certain applications, you certainly can replace the analyst, re replace the human. So I'd like to focus on two limitations of AI and machine learning that we are addressing in Ardex systems. The first limitation is just there's, just, there's not enough data to train machine learning models for all the different applications out there. So it's not a coincidence, all of us have seen AI for say face recognition, facial recognition applications or speech recognition applications. The reason that we're seeing these in the commercial sector is that there's a lot of data and a lot of people have spent a lot of time annotating that data. And that data is cheap to obtain, cheap to acquire, cheap to curate. 
But for a lot of applications, especially military applications, the data is expensive. Take, for instance, synthetic aperture radar data. Now, SAR data, that's basically 2D imagery from a, a moving radar. And uh, to collect that data is not cheap, and to annotate it is, 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 is actually a little even harder than, than kind of visible imagery. So for certain data sets and certain applications, there's just not enough data. And as you see here from the, the chart I have here, the little illustration, the amount of data, the performance as a function of the amount of data, your performance improves with the amount of data. And typically for military applications, we're over there on the, the left blue vertical line. We just don't have enough data to achieve the performance that we want. The second limitation that is well known, uh, maybe not as well known as the first limitation, is that these AI systems are easily fooled by adversarial techniques. So it's in fact easier than you think to confuse and trick these AI systems into believing something that is not true. Now take for example, um, uh, suppose you wanted to, uh, to confuse an autonomous car that a stop sign is a green light. Uh, it's actually not that hard to do that. And, and what's really scary about these kind of adversarial attacks is that it, they can be made imperceptible to a human, but still fool the uh, machine learning model. Uh, as you see in the picture here, I have an image of a tank going in as an input, and then the prediction is, is uh, another class. There, there are two different, well, there, there are many ways to attack the, an AI system, but one is you can either attack the input, as I have there, or you can attack the model. Now, we're primarily focused on those, those uh, attacks or attacking the input. And although I do have an image here, uh, keep in mind this could be both imagery um, as well as signal data as well. So, um, but these are the, the two limitations that we're addressing, you know, the, the lack of data and the ability to fool the, the, uh, the AI and ML systems. So what are we doing here to address the RDX systems? Well, let's go through these four uh, rectangles. On, and first, we're developing proprietary networks, neural networks that require much less training data. And what that's doing, that's enabling new applications where the training data is not there. Um, how are we doing that? Well, we are going from a, a, a lot of networks have been developed uh, really without these applications in mind. So we are developing our neural networks from the phenomenological point of view. So, um, and they are uh, outperforming some of these other standard state-of-the-art networks for these applications. Um, at the same time, we're also developing neural networks that are more robust adversarial practices. Our approach is indeed more robust adversarial practices, and that enables you know, more trusted and uh, reliable autonomous systems. The other, going to the, the third, the purple, um, the purple rectangle there, we're also developing techniques to detect and identify adversarial attacks. So not only making the networks more robust, we are able to detect and identify when it's being atta attacked and maybe turn that around, you know, how can you use that to identify your adversaries and, and, and perform more targeted and intelligent response. And part of all this, if we're getting so good at become robust to the attacks and detecting the attacks, we're also learning, we're also getting some deeper insight to how the neural networks work. So we're, we're, we're actually becoming pretty good at developing new innovative adversarial attacks that can fool other AI systems. So there's a, you know, we're getting involved on both sides of this. It's you know, this whole cat and mouse game, right? You know, attacking the system and, and making, becoming more robust against the attack. And this cycle is, uh, seems never ending, uh, but we're making some really good progress here at RDX 6 on, on this. So here you're going to see my limitations of my PowerPoint engineering capability. Uh, I, I just want to show two uh, examples of what we're working on here. One is maritime target classification with synthetic aperture radar imagery. Uh, if you see uh, here, we have a, a ship, this little, this little boat. They, they usually look a little more, uh, more, <laughs> more vicious than that, but I have a little picture of, of, of a boat and a satellite and an airborne platform. Each are trying to image the ship. And as I said earlier, SAR imagery it is, uh, it actually makes an image using the, mo the motion of the radar and um, the ship itself is, is attacking both or either the satellite or the airborne platform. Um, we are developing techniques that can still, still classify the ship in the presence of the adversarial attack and, and also detect these adversarial attacks. 
And by the way, I'm talk we have a satellite platform, we have an air platform, but you can imagine there are other uh, platforms of interest to the military, uh, mobile platforms where they are using synthetic aperture radar, where they, it, this could be also uh, interesting. Here's another example, detecting adversarial attacks and signals. So here you have on the left, we have a satellite communicating with the ground station. And then on the bottom right, you have two uh, cities, army tactical radios communicating. Then there's a third party out there trying to attack those, um, the, those systems. So we are developing techniques to detect and classify the attack. And what's really important there, especially in this case, unlike with the imagery place, you can now, you can now use, use that to inform an intelligent response to the attack, right? So for example, we could you know, say you know what's, who's attacking you, what, how they're attacking you, um, maybe use a different waveform, right? Or, um, uh, so anyways, th these are ways of, of addressing uh, jamming and spoofing uh, in, in uh, signal applications. As I mentioned, the applications, uh, we've been focused on our defense and military, um, aided in automatic target recognition for satellite, airborne and radar data, but as well as signal classification. But for inf there's gonna be a number of information products that we're gonna be able to support. For example, especially in synthetic aperture radar imagery, there's, uh, uh, there's really a, a significant growth in, in the uh, use of them, both in airborne and, and satellite applications in particular. And with our unique ability to, uh, to, to, to leverage AI and, and, and machine learning for uh, star imagery, we're gonna be very uniquely positioned to support and develop a, a number of information products. Um, so real quick, just to close out here, we're, we're working with uh, our current customers are DARPA, Army, Navy, Air Force. Uh, we, we hope to continue to grow with our current customers and, and build and, and, uh, and acquire new customers as well. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is there and um, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Robert. Thanks so much for that overview. Um, all right, folks on the line, um, feel free to enter any questions you have for Robert into the Q&A feature. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and so we're hoping to hit any questions that are coming through from the audience. So we'll just give that a moment um, to see if any questions populate. The anticipation's killing me here. <laughs> oh, Robert, <laughs> can you let us know your email address again? There's, there's interest from the audience to connect with you. <laughs> it's Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T dot Bach, B as in boy, O-C-K, at r hyphen dex dot com. Could I type? It? I could type it into the Q and A if it helps. I out. just did that, so hopefully, hopefully, all attendees will receive that now. So thanks for that. Certainly, interest. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we've got one question coming through. Um, so, with the deeper insight into how neural networks function, are you able to generate certification artifacts that explain or provide? Um, a mathematical second opinion of a learned system. Hmm. Can you repeat that question? I'm not sure I followed it. So did I hear certification aspects? Cert uh, so I'll read the whole question again. Yeah. With the deeper insight into how neural networks function, are you able to generate certification artifacts that explain or provide a mathematical second opinion of a learned system? We have not, we have not done that. I mean, we have not, we have not explored that yet. And they clarified, i.e. evidence used to certify a system with non-deterministic behaviors. Oh, so we, I, I think I know what, what, what the, the um, question's getting at. We have, we have um, not got, we've thought about that, but we've not explored that in any detail yet. Great, thank you. But I'd be happy to talk about it some more with, with the, uh, the person asking the question. Great, we can make that connection. 
Um, let's see, we have another question coming through and this might just be an opinion question. Um, so, you know, welcome your perspective here, but um, one attendee is asking, how do we go about not repeating what other companies have already developed in terms of machine learning? And I think that's a very broad, how do, broad how do, question. How do we go about not repeating? Yeah, I think, I think just the industry, I think is the question. Well, you know, a, a lot of, from our perspective, when, when we got into this, um, a lot of the work here is experimental. You know, you, you try to guess the, the best structure to the network and you try to guess the best architecture. And we came across, we, we came in from a, to it, at it from a different perspective. And we really looked at the phenomenology of the problem and of the data acquisition. So when we developed our networks, uh, we developed them specifically for these applications. And um, I mean, as far as I can tell, and we do feel that they're, they're novel and unique, and I don't, I don't believe they've, we're repeating uh, what anyone else has, has really looked into before. Great, thank you. Um, all right, another question. So though this isn't your primary focus, how can your work be used in the service of explainability of AI models? Explainability. Well, I, you know, that's another one where you stumped me again there. I mean, I, I think, and by the way, I, I always have to bring folks who are smarter than I am uh, on my team. To, to, but in terms of trying to explain the decision process, I think that, um, I, I think that what it, for us, we, we're, we're getting some insight into the, I mean, I, without going into detail how, we, how we're doing it, we're getting the insight into kind of how each module, each part of the network's functioning. So um, in, in terms of, of, of leveraging that to explain how the network's working, we're, we're using that to continue to develop our technologies. So it does support the explainability. And uh, again, that's something that I, I think would require a much deeper dive and maybe bring in some folks or smarter than I am on my team to, to talk about that in, in technical detail. Thank you. Awesome, I, think, I don't see any other questions in the queue. So thank you, Robert, again, for joining us and, and giving us that brief. It was really um, an interesting talk. So I know that there's interest on the BAE side and, um, and among, amongst the audience to connect with you. So um, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. All right, I am going to transition over to our next speaker, um, David Chanel from Polaris Sensor Technologies. David is founder and president of Polaris Sensor Technologies in Huntsville, Alabama, where he leads a team of 25 innovative engineers and scientists developing novel optical sensors for applications ranging from military seekers to components that complement GPS to environmental and homeland security systems. After receiving his PhD in 1992 and a postdoc at the Naval Research Lab, he worked at several defense contractors before starting Polaris in 2003. So David, thank you very much for joining us today. It looks like you've already got your slides shared. And if you're able to join via video, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm gonna have to stop sharing and then start, here we go. There. Awesome, thanks. Okay, yes, uh, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk. Um, I have to say that fire rate um, put the quite, quite the challenge uh, in front of me. Um, she wanted me to talk about quite a few things. And so uh, the agenda is down there on the bottom of the uh, page. I want to talk about the work that we've been doing um, in uh, developing special sensors for infrared polarimetric sensing, uh, target detection, and tracking. And I'll talk about that. It'll that'll uh, fit in very well with um, with some of the stuff that Kevin was talking about before. Um, also, I've, I've got just a chart or two on on uh, hypersonic ground test sensor development that we've been uh, developing for MBA applications. And then um, also I think for the precision strike and some of the GPS stuff that Tim was talking about, 
Uh, we've got some novel celestial navigation uh, capability that, that I'll also talk about briefly. So I'll try to squeeze it all in in 10 minutes. Uh, just briefly, we're located also in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, we, um, we're about 25 people. We've been doing work for the last 18 years, uh, primarily as a defense contractor, but uh, occasionally transitioning things to the commercial market. And um, we have done a lot of SBIRs, and so much of the technology that I'm talking about today is, is derived from the SBIR program. So the first uh, thing I want to talk about is, um, is the polarization-based sensors that we've been developing. This is the same polarization that we're talking about when, when you put on your polarized sunglasses uh, to defeat the glint off of the water if you're out fishing or off of uh, vehicles and traffic. Uh, the same thing applies in the infrared. And so what we've done is we've uh, built sensors that can sense that polarization. And in the infrared, and specifically in the long wave infrared, um, what we tend to pick up are man-made objects based on the, the surface roughness of the materials involved uh, and, um, and the material differences that you get between asphalt and grass and plastic and, um, and, and painted metal, painted and unpainted metal. And what we're showing in the little video is a scene, what it looks like in the visible in the upper left. The thermal scene is in the upper right. Our polarization special sauce gives you what's in the bottom left. And then um, we are actually able to collect both thermal and polarization information at the same time. And so uh, we are actually able to fuse it into a single image which we call um, enhanced thermal or e-therm image, the image in the bottom right. So the long and the short of it is, is that by adding this additional sensing modality, um, we can actually add contrast to uh, sometimes confusing infrared scenes. We can reduce clutter and we can actually uh, compress the dynamic range in a good way uh, for a lot of infrared scenes. And I'll show a couple more examples of that. We do collect it. At the same time, so we are able to do this fusion. Um, and importantly, you don't need thermal contrast. So, uh, in a couple of times a day, you go, uh, you will see infrared imagery go through thermal crossover. We are not susceptible to that. So, we, uh, uh, for that situation and others where there's low thermal contrast, we can add significant capability. Um, and the etherm display adds situational awareness, as I said. Okay, so I gave away the story there about pushing the button too fast, but um, so uh, again, uh, target detection and clutter su suppression for terrestrial scenes. Um, so for the guided missile applications uh, for precision strike. Um, in the, I'll see if my mouse uh, works. So yeah, there we go. So on the scene, one of these objects on this hillside is actually a vehicle. And if you looked at a lot of in infrared imagery, you may figure out which one it is. Um, down here, you've already got a cheater. You, you can see that there is a tank. There is a tank in the thermal image, um, but in both cases, the target of interest just really isn't visible. Um, if we add our polarization uh, information, that's what happens. And so you can see that the, the vehicle on the hillside is this guy right here, but it's the same size and has the same thermal characteristics as these creosote bushes on this desert scene in New Mexico. And so the polarization adds significantly to the ability to do uh, both detection and, and the thermal clutter suppression. These things are um, on the very first uh, page I showed the camera. Uh, it's based on uh, uncooled microbolometer technology. And so it's really quite small. Um, and, um, and so it's well suited for both handheld and for integration onto um, unmanned aerial systems. Bottom left shows a, a aerogarm with Puma and then a, a quadcopter there, which we have integrated both of these. Uh, we've integrated the, the camera onto both of these platforms. Uh, and here's an example. Again, uh, we've got thermal on the left and e-therm on the right, our enhanced thermal data product. Um, and you can see uh, as we orbit, uh, this is actually a pan of oil. So there's a commercial application for finding oil floating on water and things. But there's also other, other targets uh, located uh, in the scene that just simply are not visible in the thermal imagery. Um, there are targets that are visible thermally and we're, we don't give that ability up. 
with this sensor. So, um, so it, it's an added capability. Um, I'll let it play just one more time. So a couple of couple of thermal targets right there in the shade of that tree that you just cannot see. And um, again, there they are again. So it's a uh, it's significant capability for um, for both ground-based targets uh, and there's also a counter UAS application. This counter UAS is getting to be a really really big deal. Um, and this shows an example of this. Uh, the bottom image in this case is just a standard thermal image. And so what we've done is we've actually done the detection and tracking function using the polarized image on the top. Uh, and then we've drawn the, the, the green and red tracking boxes uh, based on the polarization image on the top onto the thermal image on the bottom. And uh, if I can pause it, um, I think I just restarted it. In any event, if you follow it, you can see that the, the um, thermal image just really goes away. Uh, and, and we, of course, have quantitative analysis on situations like that. So we're talking anywhere from, from factors of uh, two to four, uh, four times more effective at finding or increasing the contrast of the objects in, in question here. Yeah. Um, and so um, I'm just moving on quickly to uh, to the next topic. Um, so we are supporting MDA in a handful of uh, areas where um, in development of optical instrumentation for uh, supporting hypersonic uh, defensive mi missile scenarios. Uh, and um, as an optics company, what we're doing is we're helping to characterize the aero optics effects that are due to the hypersonic flow flowing over the window that you would have in a, in a hypersonic uh, interceptor. And in almost every case, you have a, an infrared seeker that, um, that has to basically guide the hit-to-kill missile for the kill uh, in the end game of the uh, intercept scenario. And uh, it has to look through a window in order to do that. And so at anywhere from Mach 6 to Mach 18 kind of uh, flows over that window. There's some pretty significant optical effects that have to be addressed. One of them is the heating effects that happens uh, when the hypersonic flow flows over the window. Now there are ways to cool it, but that actually introduces more optical effects. Um, and we're, we're addressing uh, some of those effects as well. But uh, uh, Barre was really interested in our what we call our compact lightweight window deformation imagery. And so what we've done is we've developed an optical system that can, th this is the window either in a missile or in a ground test facility. Uh, this is the window and we have developed an optical system that probes the shape of that window as it gets heated up. Um, and uh, in the ground test facility, it will look something like this where there's hypersonic flow going from left to right and the the sample under test is this window right here and this is again just a cartoon of the of the optical system that we're putting together but what results is a map that looks like this where you actually see a deformation of the window um, which can be on the order of, of fractions or even whole millimeters and so we're um, we're working on this as a part of an SBIR effort and we uh, at the end of this SBIR effort we'll actually go into a clean air facility in uh, upstate New York called HEPCAT um, or uh, a wind tunnel facility just outside the DC at Tunnel 9. Uh, both of those are air force facilities. Um, and then for the, the CLDI instrument here, um, there is a path to actually put this, deploy it in a, as a flight article in, in, a, in, a, in a real interceptor missile. Um, and, uh, and again, that will be uh, part of the phase three effort uh, after, after we conclude the following, or after, after we conclude the phase two. Um, so I think I'll run on. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Um, there's a lot more details, obviously, in such a, uh, in such a complicated physical scenario. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, what, what, we call, what we call sky pass, sky polarization and sun sensor. And this addresses some of the GPS denied stuff that uh, Tim uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it's, a, it's a device that, um, it, it's low swap, it's a daytime celestial based sensor. Uh, and again, it goes back to uh, our expertise in measuring polarization. 
it turns out that if you, um, the, the same physics that gives you blue skies and red sunsets generates maps of, of or, or generates some polarization pattern um, that you can measure and map and predict. And by using these, um, these maps, what you can do is determine pretty precisely what orientation your sensor is, is oriented at. And, and basically it's a north finding sensor. And, um, and it's actually pretty important to know which way is north or within uh, a tenth of a degree or in, in many cases better. But uh, there are a lot of applications for weapons aiming and for um, uh, GPS denied app, uh, navigation and dead reckoning scenarios to know what your heading is and not be dependent on an inertial unit or, um, or some of the other things that are currently used as well. So the important thing to note is that it, it's, it's not dependent on GPS, so it works in GPS denied scenarios. Um, it's uh, real time, it uh, provides data at multiple hertz with no startup time, which is um, a, a long startup time is one of the problems with um, many of the devices that are out there now for weapons aiming. Um, and uh, it currently works before sunrise to after sunset. We're working on uh, getting it um, working at night. Um, and this is kind of a long movie, but this is an example of the, um, of the device. Um, you know, it's a few cubic inches and weighs 12, uh, 12 ounces um, in its fully encased uh, configuration where we can lightweight it some as well. Uh, but the accuracies are on the order of um, well, in general, we say less than two milliradians. In this particular case, under good conditions, we're looking at about a half a milliradian, um, which is about 0 0.025 degrees. And I'll just, uh, yeah, in this particular case, we're 90% uh, or better in terms of the accuracy that I just quoted. And um, so just to summarize, we've got some capabilities, I think, that can address what the DAE is looking for. Um, and uh, perhaps just as, or more importantly, some of BAE's customers were already working with some of them. And uh, I think we could, uh, we could, we could add to, uh, to the capabilities involved. So I think that was 10 minutes. Uh, and there's my contact information if anybody's interested. Great, thank you, David, appreciate that. Wonderful, um, so folks in the audience, again, um, we will have a couple of minutes for Q&A for David, so feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A feature, um, and I'll just give that a moment to populate. And thanks, David, for the contact info on that slide. All right, we have one question that came in and I uh, transparency don't understand it. So David, I'm going to ask it and, and hopefully you do. <laughs> okay. um, so it says, how does the roll pitch yaw affect the accuracy of the sky pass? Yeah, it's, it's a contributor to the overall system error, but um, uh, at this point that is not, um, it's not a limiting factor. Um, we are, we're actually, providing the yaw in, in conventional IMU or uh, heading reference sensors, uh, the yaw is the least accurate. And so what our, what our sensor does is it um, tightens up the, um, the accuracy of the yaw. We, we actually have an onboard uh, roll pitch sensor that we use as an input to our algorithm. Um, but uh, the, the, the short answer is, is that the sky pass actually improves the yaw uh, reading for any kind of a navigation solution. Thank you. And I'll give it one more minute for any other questions that come through. I'm sure folks will be reaching out to you via email privately, but if anyone else has any questions for this forum, I'll give it one more minute. Appreciate everybody's attention. 
Great. Well, I don't see anything else coming through. So David, thank you so much for joining us. Really great presentation. And we appreciate your time. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so I will transition to our next speaker, um, Dr. Martin Ettenberg. Uh, Dr. Ettenberg is currently the CEO and founder of Princeton Infrared Technologies, a company dedicated to commercialization of NAR and SWIR detection technologies. He's been developing indium gallium arsenide detectors for over 20 years with previous experience at Sensors Unlimited Inc., which then became Goodrich Corporation. Uh, Martin graduated with a master's and a PhD from the University of Virginia, Department of Materials Science and Engineering, and he also received his BS in Materials Science and Engineering from Cornell University. So Martin, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. And looks like you're on video and we are starting to see your screen. Is that better? That looks perfect, wonderful. Okay. Right, I'm uh, to see you. Perfect, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for everybody for staying on today. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, Princeton Infrared Technologies, a little introduction. Um, we build shortwave infrared imagers and detectors. Um, fascinated, somebody earlier in the talk actually asked about shortwave infrared, where I feel like we're always the forgotten part of the infrared band. Um, but today I'm gonna to give you a little bit of introduction into shortwave infrared and then um, talk to you about some applications. There'll be a lot of pictures. And then I'll talk about what we do at Princeton Infrared Technologies. So um, the shortwave infrared is, is defined from um, 1,000 nanometers to 2,600 nanometers. And then we have the what's called the near infrared at 750 to 1,000 nanometers, which is basically beyond what the eye sees. The eye sees from 450 to 750, which is a uh, visible range. Uh, and then beyond that um, is basically the short or the infrared um, and the shortwave infrared is basically beyond where silicon detects and we have several materials that do this there's indium gallium arsenide it's various alloys there's indium intimidide there's mercury cadmium telluride and um, but mostly most people talk about with shortwave infrared is last match indium gallium arsenide which we all abbreviate as in gas which is 5347 and this is last matched indium phosphide, and it cuts off at around 1700 nanometers. And the reason this is used is because it produces very low dark current. Now there are compositions of indium gallium arsenide that'll let you go to um, longer wavelengths uh, out to 2500 nanometers, um, but those have a lot more dark current and they require cooling. The beauty of last matched in gas is uh, there's no cooling required. So, um, it, it's a room temperature operating uh, detector. And indium intimidide and Mercad, they have been used in the past and they still are used, especially for the longer wavelength, about to 2500, but they require significant cooling, which leads to size, weight, and power problems, um, as well as cost. Um, there are some newer materials out there, these uh, colloidal quantum dots. Uh, they're very low cost technology, it's very new. Um, they have very small pitch. Um, long-term reliability hasn't been really looked at yet on those. Uh, but the big problem with them, most military applications as well as commercial is um, granted they're very cheap, uh, but they have very poor sensitivity and they have much higher noise. So um, a factor of five to 10 times less sensitivity, factor of three to four times as much noise, um, which is problematic. So why do we care about shortwave infrared? Well. Uh, especially lattice matched in gas, we can see all the battlefield lasers. So we can see the 905 nanometers used with night vision goggles, uh, 106 laser designators uh, as seen on the right here, uh, used for dropping munitions, and then 155 eye safe lasers used for laser range finding. Um, and uh, indium gallium arsenide is so sensitive to 106. Um, silicon detectors were traditionally used, which are on the front of munitions, um, those have a quantum efficiency or amount of detection of about 5%, maybe 3% at 106. Uh, indium gallium arsenide is all the way up at 65, 70% quantum efficiency. So you have a factor of 10 times more sensitivity and we're so sensitive that you can actually see the laser reflecting off dust particles in the air at night. Um, in addition to being able to pick up lasers, um, we can see hot objects, about anything above about 100 degrees C. 
uh, as opposed to the earlier talks we heard about long wave infrared, where we actually pick up essentially body heat. Uh, short wave infrared, we don't see body heat. It's, uh, if you look at a person and you'll see reflected imagery, which I'll show in a little bit, but we do see things that above about 100, 120 degrees C. So rocket motors, jet engines, even cigarettes show up very well. Um, short wave infrared most of the time negates the effects of camouflage. Camouflage has made fool our eyes. Uh, but if we go outside of the visible range, camouflage becomes ineffective. And if you look at multiple wavelengths of light, you can actually tell uh, Russian camouflage from American, from European camouflage. Um, and then finally, shortwave infrared has better penetration to the atmosphere and smoke than visible. And we'll show some of that. So here is, uh, this is over Lake Carnegie in, uh, in Princeton. Uh, not exactly a big hazy day, but it kind of shows the, the capability of shortwave infrared uh, for seeing through, I'm going to call it hazy conditions. So this is a, these are buoys that are about half meter big and, and you're looking at it 500 and 1,000 meters away with a wide field of view lens. Um, this is versus a 5.3 megapixel visible camera. And those buoys, they're actually crew buoys that mark the uh, crew course so we know exactly how far they are. Um, you can't even pick up the thousand meter buoy uh, on the lake in the visible. Uh, and this is a camera with four times as many pixels as the in-gas camera. But the in-gas camera is able to pick up the buoy quite well. Um, uh, nighttime performance. Uh, nighttime shortwave infrared has advantages over uh, visible cameras because there's just more light out there. Uh, the graph shown in the center here um, this shows uh, two conditions, both the light oop, available, let me flip back, with the full moon, and then the light available when there's no moon out, when there's starlight. And when there's starlight only, um, you have the combination of stars as well as what's called night glow, which is hydrogen and oxygen combining in the upper atmosphere. And that this produces light that we can actually image by. And on the left, this was taken by the U.S. Army, uh, looking at uh, a scene at night. Um, and with no, with I think no moon, uh, with a yeah moonless night with an I squared CCD on the top, which is a night vision tube with a CCD camera behind it, and then a SWIR camera on the bottom. Now night vision tubes are fantastic devices; um, they're really great for imaging and low power. But the problem is the only person that can really use it is the person looking through the tube. When we put these cameras behind them, we can transmit the information. Uh, but as you can see, the imagery is not that great. When you use a shortwave infrared camera, now you have the advantage of being able to see lasers and other uh, phenomenology, as we'll call it, but there's just more light to see by, and so we can see at night better with the shortwave infrared. Now on the right, uh, this is out in the Las Vegas desert, um, and you're able to pick up lots of objects in shortwave infrared that you can't see otherwise, like that airplane in the distance has got to be about 20 to 30 miles away, uh, landing in Las Vegas. Uh, and the cigarette he threw on the ground is so bright that it actually lights up his back. And that's just the glow from the cigarette emitting enough light in shortwave infrared. Um, as I said, uh, fog penetration is better in the shortwave infrared versus visible. This is Orlando. We're looking through three miles away from one hotel to another hotel. Uh, this is across the bay in San Francisco where we have uh, penetration through the fog. Uh, I'm not saying we can see through all fog. It's uh, it's dependent on droplet size and type of fog, but uh, generally shortwave infrared because of the wavelength of this light has better penetration than visible. Uh, this is through smoke, uh, looking through forest fires uh, in the Northwest. A small UAV is carrying both the shortwave infrared and a visible camera, and we're able to see the difference between visible and shortwave infrared looking through smoke. And then uh, shortwave infrared, uh, this is on the left, this is me in the shortwave infrared. Um, and the lights are off in the room. It's a totally darkened room. And the only thing lighting us up is that soldering iron, which is turned on. And it's emitting so much light that it's actually acting like a light bulb. Um, as you can see, my hair becomes highly reflective. Uh, skin color goes dark. There is no real race in the shortwave infrared. You're looking at water absorption in the skin. Uh, hair is highly reflective. Uh, unless you don't have real hair, and then I don't recommend standing in front of a shortwave infrared camera as uh, it won't be reflective, it'll be black, and people will know you don't have real hair, which does happen on showroom floors quite often uh, when we're uh, showing off our camera. But on the right, uh, our imagers actually see visible and shortwave infrared light. 
And so when the lights turn on in the room, you can see the pattern on my shirt comes back because we're now seeing visible light and my hair goes dark because the visible light is now dominating over the shortwave infrared because of the light source we're using. So what are we at Princeton Infrared Technologies? We're actually a fabulous company that's building shortwave infrared. And we're one of the, uh, I'm going to say few for a while, I could say only, but I think there may be others now. Uh, they're trying this model. So in the past, if you were making infrared cameras, you had your own foundry and because nobody else would make these exotic materials. Um, but now we're able to produce these uh, three, five materials in uh, modern three, five foundries, which produce many different types of materials. So we're actually leveraging this technology much like they do in the silicon industry where most people now don't own their own fabs in silicon. Uh, they just make their designs and run them through fabs. And we're doing that now with indium gallium arsenide. Uh, and we're one of the first people to really do this. Uh, we're using four inch technology. Uh, most people are still on three inch technology on wafer size. Granted, some of you out there, you may say that's really small compared to silicon. And yes, we are uh, several decades behind silicon. Uh, but four inch is state of the art. Uh, we're also leveraging new ROIC technologies. And the advantage of this is we're able to build better infrared detectors in the competition at lower cost uh, by leveraging larger foundries that are making hundreds, if not thousands of wafers a month uh, versus smaller foundries, which typically use, which only make tens of wafers a month. So at Princeton Infrared Technologies, we do the design uh, we have outside resources to do our epitaxial growth of material and our photodiode processing. Uh, we have a design houses that do our ROIC designs. Uh, we have another partner that does hybridization. And then it comes back for test and verification and packaging. Uh, at that point, we either sell the focal plane arrays or the imaging devices to people who want to insert them in systems, or we build them further up into cameras and we do non-uniformity corrections in the camera core, attach optics, or we allow that for our partners to do. So this is our newest camera, uh, 1280 by 1024 on 12 micron pitch, uh, low noise, uh, high frame rate, 95 Hertz for full 1280 by 1024, uh, does 14 bits, uh, sees from visible at 400 nanometers all the way to 1700 nanometers at 25 degrees C, uh, runs at room temperature, very linear response. Uh, we also have a, a, a different version of this camera, which is our science camera, which is a cooled version of this for people doing astronomy and biology who want very high sensitivity. Uh, but for this audience, I thought this camera is more uh, apropos. Um, we also build uh, line scan cameras. Uh, these are linear arrays, um, 1,024 elements on 12 and a half micron pitch. They're mostly used in spectroscopy and machine vision applications. We do a lot of commercial uh, work, um, low read noise, uh, they have camera link as well as USB 3 uh, and 14 bit digital output. And it's the only linear array in the world that can see visible through shortwave infrared in the same detector. Um, and these are used in various applications, the commercial world from plastic sorting and agricultural sorting. Um, in this case, we're looking at coffee beans uh, versus woods and rock. And you can see the coffee, well, this is brown, very hard to tell apart in the visible. But in the shortwave infrared, you can see the coffee beans totally stand out. We find bruises on fruit, various other applications. On the military side, we have several uh, SBIR programs right now, three of them currently running. Um, on the right, we built two micron detectors for LADAR applications. Uh, we're building a 640 by 512 imager for a 155 munition to go on the front for precision targeting. Uh, we're building a LADAR uh, array and camera uh, an APD LADAR camera for missile defense agency for space-based imaging applications. And we've also built a uh, imager that for a hypervelocity projectile that can survive. The camera itself has been built and survived 30,000 G shock loads for launch. Um, this camera is built to go on the front of a hypervelocity projectile for interception. So uh, we have submissions in for various other programs. Uh, and we also have two DOTSI efforts, actually. We're working with DAE now. Uh, coincidentally. Uh, in conclusions, um, we build FPAs and imagers in the shortwave infrared. We're really not looking to move up the food chain on that, uh, but we need partners to incorporate our devices and our, uh, our cameras and imagers. And we're looking to be a, a big square imager supplier, uh, as well as we need more allies for technology development. So and my contact information is below, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
hoping I'm only slightly over 10 minutes. That was great. Thank you, Martin. Very cool imaging. Thank you. Um, so folks on the line, again, same deal. Uh, if you have questions for Martin, feel free to enter them into the Q&A feature. Um, we did have one question come through during um, the presentation, Martin, um, and that is, where is your manufacturing located? Uh, so we have offices in Princeton, New Jersey, and, uh, and our manufacturing is all done in the United States. We don't give out our various manufacturing partners, but um, all the manufacturing is done in the United States. Um, we do that for ITAR purposes, but uh, in reality, our commercial products are all ITAR free. So um, it's only important to our government military customers that we still have the ITAR capability. Great, thank you. Um, and another question that just came through, what is dark current and why is it an important parameter? Uh, so dark current is, um, it's when the imager is in the dark, you're still producing um, uh, signal, it's dark signal. It's, it's, it's from, uh, it's because uh, we live in a world that's above absolute zero. So uh, electrons and holes manage to jump the gap in our semiconductors. And uh, as you get higher in temperature, dark current goes up. And so dark current is a signal that exists even in the dark. So the more dark current you have, the more noise you have. And the higher amount of dark current uh, leads to a more noisier detector. And so we try to minimize dark current. And so that's why Mercad and Insby and those other devices, they have a lot of dark current. And so what they do is they cool those detectors. And that's how you uh, beat down dark current. So you have less noise in those detectors. Great. Thank you. All right. I haven't seen any other questions come through. I'm sure people are taking down your contact info, um, but really appreciate you being with us here today, Martin. Uh, great presentation and looking forward to future discussions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, we are going to transition to our last speaker, Dr. James Carswell. Um, James received a PhD, and sorry, he is from Remote Sensing Solutions. Uh, James received a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a BSEE degree from Tufts University. He spent more than a decade at UMass Amherst leading research programs to develop its advanced sensors and algorithms for NASA and NOAA airborne and satellite missions and serving on several satellite mission calibration and validation teams. In 2003, he co-founded Remote Sensing Solutions and as its chief technology officer today, he serves as the company's main technology visionary for providing hardware, digital processing, radar system, and data management solutions for remote sensing applications. In this role, James has led the development of their next generation defined software-defined radar platform and advanced radar systems for a broad range of applications such as situational awareness, centimetric topography mapping, autonomous navigation, small object detection, and tropical cyclone and severe weather remote sensing. James, thank you so much for being with us today. It looks like you are on video and you've got your slides ready to go, so I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of RSS, I first want to thank uh, you all for this opportunity to uh, present our company, our technology, and the very exciting path that we uh, have embarked on uh, in the last several years as we've uh, entered from earth science and, and have been entering into the defense market space. Uh, RSS was founded with the mission of developing next generation sensors, sensor technology and processors uh, to provide critical observations and information about the environment around us. Uh, our initial focus was advancing sensor technology uh, for airborne applications uh, to provide much needed and improved observations of the oceans, atmosphere, cryosphere, and for, uh, for particular applications and advancing our ability to accurately uh, predict tropical cyclone and severe weather intensity, uh, as well as get a much better understanding of the climate and the environment around us. Uh, these applications were all focused initially on radar type systems. Uh, with this sort of background uh, or um, 
work, we, our, our customer base was uh, primarily uh, agencies such as NASA, JPL, uh, NOAA, and a lot of other earth science uh, focused research groups. In, in 2016, uh, I decided I needed to fire myself as the CEO and uh, hire um, Mike Fernandez on board uh, to come in as our CEO to really help us commercialize. Because during that time frame, uh, we had really uh, advanced a lot of our technology and IP, and we could see that it had a lot of application outside of the spaces that we're uh, operating within. And most importantly, we really needed to begin the transition from an R&D only uh, to a broad product-based uh, company. Since making that transition, uh, our revenue has uh, gone from 2 million to 4 million. Uh, we now have uh, 14 people uh, in our company, uh, 12 uh, full-time uh, employees with five PhDs. Uh, and we really are expecting uh, substantial growth. We're moving into a new 5,000 square foot facility uh, in Bourne. Uh, with our transition from uh, being from earth science and really over the last several years, moving more into the defense marketplace, uh, this new facility will also, we're going through the process to be able to have a secret uh, uh, clearance for the facility itself. Um, the, through the years, uh, you can also see that our company uh, has been very active uh, in the R&D side uh, with uh, having several uh, phase one and phase two SBIRs, primarily uh, with NASA and NOAA, but now we're starting to do work uh, with, uh, in the defense sector uh, with the Navy uh, and, and of course with defense contractors. Um, but more importantly, uh, with the SBIRs, they, we weren't just doing the phase one, phase twos. We were, we were transitioning uh, very successfully into uh, phase three um, programs and really bringing the new technology uh, into the market. Uh, shown here is just to kind of uh, illustrate the, uh, how we've expanded our client base. Uh, if you looked at that a few years ago, a, a lot of uh, defense uh, contractors and, uh, and uh, agencies were not on this slide, uh, but we've really, uh, as we've introduced our uh, arena technology, which I'll be presenting, uh, we've been able to capture the attention uh, of a lot of folks and, and we're working very closely now uh, on a, a couple exciting projects with BAE. Kind of give you an overview of what our, our capabilities are, the sort of problems uh, that we've been solving. Uh, shown here is a slide of uh, just several different application spaces ra uh, using radar systems that we've developed uh, to solve. In the upper left, you, we have a C and KU band system on the P3, a KA and KU band system on the Global Hawk. These are multi-beam conical scanning uh, phased array uh, system. And we're able to map the, uh, observe and map the tropospheric, atmospheric, and surface vector winds of the surface in uh, tropical cyclones, severe storms, as well as the precipitation. Beneath that uh, is an image, that's an image of a glacier in, uh, up in Greenland. And it's an interferometric measurement where we have built several uh, K band uh, interferometric uh, SARS. This is a, a cross track interferometer that's capable of measuring decimeter and even centimetric uh, topography measurements. And uh, the image there is actually the topography being measured by this system as we're flying over an ice flow in Greenland. And the resolutions that we're getting now are equivalent uh, to the LIDAR systems that they used to fly. And this was collected from a NASA uh, Gulfstream aircraft uh, flying uh, routine missions to monitor the ice sheets. In the top middle, uh, we're applying uh, millimeter wave and microwave uh, inter interferometry cross-track and a long track uh, for flood mapping to detect uh, where the water is, where it's moving. And then also uh, we have advanced hydrology models 
uh, and we're pulling that in to really uh, produce the flood inundation maps that are needed uh, for emergency management and for planning. Uh, in the middle, we've done a lot of calibration validation. We've developed a lot of sensors for next generation satellite systems for NASA and NOAA or to address problems that uh, they have had interpreting the data that they've been uh, collecting. On the left of that middle uh, section is a KUK band dual pole matched beam uh, radar system that was a ground base in this case, uh, serve as CalVal instrument for the GPM uh, uh, global precision measurement uh, mission with a DPR radar that was on board. Uh, the, the phased array in the middle is a demonstration as a meter aperture uh, KA band digital beam forming system that was uh, developed as a technology demonstration uh, that we did for NASA uh, to demonstrate uh, the ability to use such a, uh, an array in space. Uh, for ScanSAR applications and for direct uh, K-band interferometric measurements. Beneath, uh, this is sort of our uh, getting closer, probably more to uh, defense-related applications, although the target isn't. Uh, we're applying uh, K-band interferometry uh, to detect uh, subpixel uh, objects. Uh, in this case, it's in cryospheric. Uh, but then we started applying it. We have a, a program called VSON that is focused on using multi-dimensional sampling uh, at millimeter wave uh, interferometric uh, SARS to find small objects that are subpixel uh, within the marine environment. In the upper left, in, in our upper right, in the, on the right side, uh, we're looking at uh, hazard mapping um, in uh, utilizing uh, our technology to be able to provide forward scene uh, topography mapping uh, at uh, decimetric measurement out to 10 kilometers to provide uh, situational awareness and enable, uh, in this case, it was for NASA, uh, enable unmanned aircraft to fly in the national airspace by addressing the issue of having real-time information about the topography uh, in the scene around them during uh, takeoff, landing, taxiing, and low altitude flights. Um, one of the things that we recognized in our, across all the different applications that we've been operating in is that effectively for all these different types of sensors, whether it's a simple sit and spin radar or uh, a very complex millimeter wave interferometric star flying on an unmanned aircraft at 70,000 feet, a lot of the math, uh, the, the, the signal processing, and even the control and timing of these systems are, are, are the same. And uh, so we started in the technology that was out there was very expensive uh, you're reinventing the wheel a lot, and it's also very uh, limiting in terms of the swap. So we have these fantastic capabilities, but we're limited on the platforms that we could uh, deploy them on. And so what we did is we, we uh, took our knowledge and came up with a very unique uh, system architecture uh, that encapsulated each one of the functions uh, that a radar uh, or a profiling system may, may do and encapsulate at a level where we could describe it then with very simple XML objects and then designed our hardware, our firmware, and our software around that sort of uh, uh, approach. And that gave us uh, several very important advantages. First, by taking that approach, we could control what the system's doing at every level on a pulse-to-pulse uh, -pulse basis. That allowed us to really optimize and uh, make the system much more efficient. And that allowed us to reduce the size of the, the back end, the, uh, the software-defined radar, um, by more than an order of magnitude. Uh, and as it, by removing the heat, we can make much, much smaller systems. And then uh, as uh, that then allowed us to start looking at uh, deploying technology that used to be on the P3 or on very large aircraft to start transitioning it to uh, smaller platforms. Um, the ability to also change on a pulse to pulse or even within a pulse, uh, everything that the system is doing allows the uh, radar system uh, with this technology 
to truly be uh, multi-mode. So you can have a system flying on a pulse-to-pulse -pulse basis. It could be going from a wide area surveillance to high resolution uh, SAR to an MTI uh, type of mode um, and, and, and seamlessly. Um, this in its, the architecture allows this uh, not through complex uh, coding, uh, but rather these very simple XML objects. Um, further, because of a lot of the applications that we worked in, we designed this technology uh, to be uh, phase synchronous and mode synchronous. So this allows us to combine multiple arenas to then solve more complex problems uh, for uh, phased arrays or even uh, distributed uh, sensors. And kind of give you an example of how well this has worked or the ability to support across multiple domains. Uh, listed there are several different uh, applications where we're using the exact same uh, arena platform to solve. So we're using in our landing radars, autonomous landing radars for planetary uh, and terrestrial uh, applications, uh, altimeters uh, in our millimeter wave interferometric radars and stars, uh, in uh, just very simple ground-based airborne uh, wet weather radars that are more your simple sit and spin Doppler radars, uh, to uh, situational awareness and mapping radars like uh, the path in system, which is uh, providing the forward scene topography. Um, we've been able, uh, we've even begun deploying this in sonar systems, this exact same technology. Uh, and so the, uh, the technology at this stage is very mature. We have sold uh, over 100 uh, units um, and systems. Uh, and it's been deployed from 800 feet below the Arctic ice uh, uh, in support of uh, MIT Lincoln Lab uh, experiment uh, to over 70,000 feet uh, in uh, deployments on the ER-2 or U-2 aircraft and on the uh, Global Hawk. Um, the, the, um, I'm going to go to kind of give you a, a, a better feeling for the type of systems that are uh, uh, that we're deploying in this in the uh, this has been over the last year some systems that we've built um, for BAE uh, we we have a project right now that we're just about to go out and deploy uh, it's a four channel KU band uh, SAR uh, system that's uh, capable of wide area surveillance uh, high resolution imaging uh, MTI and target detection. Uh, for the Navy, uh, we're using uh, the, the same arenas in a real-time radar test system that captures uh, the, the live transmit signal from a radar and simulates different targets and produces that back and does this uh, all over the air to allow the Navy to uh, test uh, their radar systems that are deployed on uh, their vessels, as well as use it for training uh, their um, operators in more realistic scenarios without having to leave the harbor. Um, we're deploying, uh, we built a KU, KA band synthetic aperture altimeter that's all arena based that is providing NOAA right now. Uh, it's being deployed on the hurricane missions to uh, provide uh, information about the sea surface, so wave height and significant wave heights. Uh, for NASA, we have the, uh, in working with Lockheed uh, as a commercial par partner, uh, the phased terrain, terrain hazard. Uh, you can see there where we've really been able to, with the arena technology, miniaturize each one of those. That's a 64 element K band uh, phased array. Uh, each one of those elements uh, is actually a full uh, transceiver, uh, not just up converter and down converter, but uh, uh, very novel patented internal cal loops that allows us to get down to 10 milli degrees or less of phase accuracy uh, with these systems. Uh, we're, we have a program right now with the Navy where we're deploying this to uh, develop uh, a micro uh, or a, uh, a SAS um, system uh, for micro uh, UUVs. Uh, so the system there uh, with the arena is able to fit within a six inch aperture and provide the same sort of uh, coverage rate that very large systems that are being deployed uh, from ships are, are, uh, are, are providing. Uh, at the same time, because of the multi-mode feature in, that, uh, in the um, sonar system, 
we are also able to hop between different modes and provide uh, multiple beams looking forward to provide uh, um, automation uh, for the navigation and situational awareness and uh, bathymetry uh, measurements at the same time. We're deploying, uh, we just built a, another system for the University of Alabama, uh, which is an eight channel um, synthetic aperture or eight channel uh, software defined radar system that's based on the arenas for looking beneath the ice uh, sheets and uh, for the terrain and objects that may be below. Um, that whole system right now uh, is going to be replaced by our next generation Arena 500, uh, which will then uh, only occupy a four by eight by one and a half inch area and have the, all the same capabilities uh, as that, that sensor has there. Um, so uh, w some of the key aspects or points on the company right now. Uh, is that it, we've uh, made the decision uh, back in, or made the transition in 2016 to uh, move out of R&D uh, in the science realm. And, and we are now actively uh, looking for partners uh, in the defense sectors. Uh, it's enabled us to uh, really begin uh, rapid growth within the company. And a lot of the technology that we have, uh, especially the imaging technology and the software defined uh, radar system technology that we have, uh, we believe have a lot of um, uh, worth uh, to the defense sector. Um, so for, uh, in to date, uh, the, the company we've been able uh, through our R&D to be uh, fully self-funded, um, but we're at a stage right now where we're uh, seeking to really uh, expand the growth of the company and, and partner to uh, be able to um, uh, really bring our technology uh, at, at, to the large scale to the marketplace. Um, and I'll end with just showing that uh, we also, the company uh, has, uh, several, has patents uh, issued and that we have uh, focused around this technology and uh, we're going through um, the uh, uh, application process on, on uh, a bunch of other uh, IP within in the company. And so that's it. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. That was a great overview. Um, so we have um, a couple questions. I think we have just time for one, um, just given how much time we have left in the session. Um, so one question that came through was, does the radar test system support encrypted modes like mode five? The, uh, <laughs> that I, I don't, I can't answer. I'm not familiar uh, with that. Uh, what I can say uh, about uh, the uh, software defined or the, the, that system is that um, we have designed it uh, to be um, to be able to be uh, secured. Um, that uh, the uh, it's implementing uh, in its sort of uh, Durfum type of mode um, full arbitrary uh, waveform generation. Uh, so it enables us to support uh, a, a very broad uh, sector of uh, waveforms. Um, for the scene generation. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, James, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and giving us an overview of the remote sensing solutions. Um, so we are on our midst to wrapping up the session. Um, I just wanna thank Robert and David and Martin and James again for your time. Um, I'm continually inspired by the Venture Cafe community and the potential collaborations that can come out of these events. So um, thank you all for joining us. I am going to turn it over to Gil Gonzalez one more time. I think he has a couple of announcements, but thank you all again for joining. Hello again. Uh, BA is participating in two more Venture Cafe events this year, so look for event announcements with details for um, October 15th and November 19th. So, um, Look for, for uh, announcements for those dates and uh, you'll find details about those um, as, we, as, as they evolve. Okay, right. thank you.
All right. And I would like to wrap this up by thanking BAE Systems for participating in Virtual Venture Cafe and enabling us to bring this content to the community. Uh, we are a community community of innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, and these types of actions are what really make the innovation happen. So thank you so much. And I uh, just want to let everyone know that the networking room will be open from 5.30 to 7.30 if you want to carry on the conversation over there at any point. I will drop a link to that right now and you can click on that and we'll see you there or we'll see you on October 15th. Thanks so much, everybody. Be good.